The Bible makes it clear that there is only one way out of the prison of death and sin. There's only one way that leads to eternal life. There may be many different types of faith and many different types of religion in the world, but only one can lead us to eternal life. In 1975, conditions inside the Saltillo prison in northern Mexico had reached inhumane levels. The cells were overcrowded. There wasn't enough food to eat, and beatings and even murder were common occurrences in the prison. The situation was so bad that in November, 75 desperate prisoners decided to attempt to escape from Saltillo prison. They formed a pact with one another and agreed to work together to dig an underground tunnel that would take them outside the prison to freedom. The group of prisoners worked in secret for six months, digging an escape tunnel. Finally, in April 1976, they estimated that they had dug far enough outside to escape the prison. They began digging up to the surface of the ground, and on April 18th, they broke through the surface of the ground. But to their shock and dismay, in spite of their sincere desire to be free, they discovered too late that they were sincerely wrong in their escape. The tunnel they dug didn't lead to freedom. In fact, it led them right back into captivity. For when they climbed up out of their tunnel, they discovered that they had actually arrived inside the courtroom of the local court. Their tunnel to freedom had a wrong destination, and all 75 prisoners were quickly captured and returned to prison. Without a map or a guide, all their hard work and good intentions simply led them to the wrong destination. And there's a lesson for all of us in the true story of the failed escape from Saltillo Prison. If you think you know where you're going, but you have no map or guide to help you, then you may arrive at a destination you never intended to reach. You may do your best to plan and work and follow what you think is the best path, but intentions don't determine destination. You may be sincere in your beliefs, but you may be sincerely wrong. Nowhere is this more important than in matters of faith and salvation. For you see, today, there are millions of people just like those 75 desperate prisoners. Millions of people today are very sincere in their search for salvation. They believe they're on the path to escape from the prison of sin and death. They think that it doesn't really matter what path they choose as long as they work hard and follow it faithfully. In the world today, millions of people believe that diligently pursuing a path to salvation will result in salvation no matter which way that path leads. But the reality is quite different. The Bible makes it clear that there is only one way out of the prison of death and sin. There's only one way that leads to eternal life. There may be many different types of faith and many different types of religion in the world, but only one can lead us to eternal life. That's the powerful truth in our sermon today. We're going to discover the bold claim of Jesus Christ written in the Bible. The claim that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But before we examine his claims, let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you for gathering us around the world today in your presence to study your word. Teach us. Give us divine revelation. Send down the spirit of light and truth to pierce our hearts that we might know the truth and know the only way to salvation. We submit to you now. We bind every voice of the devil that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the spirit of the living God, the spirit of light and life to penetrate our hearts and take us closer to you. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I invite you to take a moment and join your faith with mine right now. Put your hand on your chest and pray after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Truth For Today. It's great to have you here with me as we study God's Word together. Each week, we have people joining us from all over the world, all across Africa, from the Middle East, the United States, Europe, and the Pacific region. So I'd like to just take a moment and say welcome to everyone from around the world, wherever you are right now. I trust that the truth of God's Word and the power of his Holy Spirit will minister to you. If you would, just take a moment and type a comment on Facebook or on YouTube or wherever you're watching from and let us know where you're located as the Spirit of God locates you today. Well, you've chosen a great day to join me as we're in the second week of our sermon series, Is That in the Bible? Throughout this series, we're taking a deeper look into God's Word, and I want to challenge everyone throughout this month to have a living word encounter and get into God's Word like never before. Read the Bible, memorize the Scriptures, meditate on God's Word, and join me each week as we ask, is that In the Bible, we began this series last week by discovering the truth that the Bible is our sole foundation for anything and everything we believe and practice as Christians. If it's in the Bible, it's our standard. And it's vital that we continually remind ourselves of this truth because today there are a lot of strange and wrong and weird doctrines running through the world and even in the church. The Bible tells us that in the end times, in the last days, people will be deceived as never before. And we see this happening all around us today. People accept all kinds of strange ideas and popular sayings as if they are the truth. And rather than checking to see what God says in the Bible, people seem more interested in following ideas that make them feel good. That's why it's common today to hear people say, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Many people believe that all roads lead to heaven and that all religions can help you find God as long as you're sincere in your search. But is that in the Bible? Well, to help us discover the truth today, we've prepared sermon notes. You can download the sermon notes and the daily devotional from my website and all my social media platforms. So go ahead, take out your sermon notes now and follow along with me as we examine three things to consider about Jesus Christ. And there at the top of your notes is our scripture text for today. It's one simple statement from Jesus found in John 14, 6. It's on your notes. It's on the screen ahead of you. But I believe God's word has the most impact when it's in our hearts and on our lips. So I'm going to ask you to join me and read this verse out loud together. Are you ready? Let's read it like we mean it. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. If you believe it, say amen. Listen, friends, Jesus comes out and makes a very bold statement in John 14, 6. To anyone who's unsure, to anyone who doubts, to anyone who's waffling, Jesus brings the sharp sword of his truth. There's no middle ground. There's no other option. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no man, no woman, no Muslim, no Jew, no Hindu, no Buddhist, no pagan, no atheist, no one can come to God the Father except through Jesus Christ. And in the face of that bold, unequivocal statement, we're all faced with a choice. Do you believe Jesus or not? For Jesus separates all of mankind into two groups. You either believe him or you don't. There's no middle ground. There's no third way. Either he is who he says he is or he's a liar. So let's take a moment today to consider Jesus Christ. Is he who he says he is? Was he a good man who presented one possible option of a way to God? Or is he, as he claims, the only way to heaven? And here's the first thing you need to consider about Jesus. Consider the claims of Jesus. I believe in an intelligent gospel. I'm not afraid to put the doctrines and the truths of the Bible up for cross-examination. I'm willing to put the claims of Jesus up against any other claims. I'm willing to put the claims of Jesus up against the claims of Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or anyone else. 
Because if you claim to have a system of faith that will save a soul, you must be willing to have those claims examined. If you claim that you possess the truth, you must be willing to allow others to question your truth. If you propose a solution for mankind, then you should be willing to discuss the proposal. Any group or any religion that wants to force their faith on you by gunpoint is a false religion. Any religion that holds innocent people hostage and forces them by guns to recite religious statements is a counterfeit religion. See, Christianity is more than just a spiritual experience. It's more than just an encounter with the supernatural. It's more than a dream or a vision in the desert. It's more than just chanting and praying and giving alms and going through religious ceremonies and rituals. It involves all that, but it's also a reasoned, intelligent, morally defendable system of beliefs that stands up to the test and challenges of the most discerning examination. And the basis for our faith begins with the claims of Jesus Christ about himself. And the fact is, Jesus repeatedly claimed about himself that he was the only one who could bring men to God the Father. We already saw his claim in John 14, 6, that he's the only way to God. But listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. Here, he repeats his claim to be the only way to the Father. Jesus said, my father has entrusted everything to me. Somebody say everything. No one truly knows the son except the father. And no one truly knows the father except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Later in the Bible, this same truth is repeated boldly. In Acts 4.12, Peter said, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It's only the name of Jesus. So the Bible makes it clear. God has not given any other name for salvation. There's no other person, no other savior, no other religion that can bring us to God. There's only one way, and that is God's own son, Jesus Christ. And when you consider the claims of Jesus Christ, you can come to only one conclusion. Jesus is either a liar, or a lunatic, or Jesus is the Lord. See, some people say, well, Jesus was a good man, but he's not the Savior. He's not God. He came to live a life that would show us all an example of how to live. But that's all. But friend, if Jesus is just a good man, then why did he himself claim to be the only way to God? If Jesus is nothing more than a good example for us to follow, why did he himself say, no one can know God except I reveal him? Some people say that Jesus was a prophet. For example, Muslims will tell you that they believe in Jesus as a prophet. But they deny that he was anything more than that. Just a prophet. But that's not what Jesus said about himself. If Jesus knew that he was not God, if Jesus knew he was just a prophet, and yet he came to say he was the only way to heaven, then Jesus was a liar. And if Jesus believed he was God but he was deceived, then he's a lunatic. He must have been mentally unstable. If a man came to your compound and began telling you, I'm God, I'm God, most likely that man would be locked up in the psychiatric hospital. He would be given a psychiatric evaluation. You can't have it both ways. Either Jesus is whom he claimed, or he's a liar or a lunatic. And the fact is, Jesus not only claimed to be the only way to heaven, he also made other bold claims. In John 17, 5, Jesus claimed to be with God the Father before the world began. Listen to his words. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. In John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus claimed to have the power to give life to anyone who believed in him. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Wow. And in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus goes even further when he claimed all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
So think about what Jesus is saying. He's not just claiming to be a prophet. He's not just claiming to have a word from God. He's claiming that he, Jesus, has authority over every matter in heaven and on earth. He's claiming to be equal to God in every way. He's making the boldest statement in the history of the world about his identity. And some people believe everything about Jesus, but they stop short of saying that he's God. Some people will agree on every claim of Jesus, but they'll tell you he never claimed to be God. But the fact is, Jesus did indeed claim to be God. He acknowledged that he's God when he received worship. See, all through the life of Jesus on earth, he allowed men and women to worship him. Matthew 14, 33, the disciples worshiped him. In Matthew 15, 25, the Canaanite woman worshiped him. In John 9, 38, the blind man Jesus healed uh, worshiped him. After the resurrection, the disciples worshiped him. Jesus never stopped anyone from worshiping him. He never rebuked them. And every time Jesus receives worship, he's making a statement. He's making a claim that he is God. You may remember in Matthew chapter 4 when the devil came to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. The devil said to Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. But in Matthew 4.10, Jesus replied, get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So Jesus knew. That worship is for the almighty God alone. Yet when people came to worship Jesus, he accepted their worship. He did not stop them. He received their worship because Jesus claims to be God. If someone came to me today and started to worship me, I would stop them. No, stop. I'm not God, I would shout. For I know that to receive their worship would be an act of idolatry and blasphemy and sin. And Jesus knew this too. But he accepted and received worship. He did so because he's God. He is Lord. Consider the claims of Jesus. He claims to be the only way to God. He claims to be the only source of life and truth. If he knew these claims weren't true, he's not a prophet. He's not a good man. He would be a liar. If he thought these claims were true but they were not, then he was deceived. And then he's a lunatic. He's not an example to follow or a holy man. He would be a madman. But if his claims are true, then Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. So first, consider the claims of Jesus. Then second, consider the life of Jesus. See, Jesus didn't just make claims with his mouth. He backed it up with his power. His life is a testimony to the truth. Once there was a missionary in Brazil who discovered a tribe of Indians living in a remote part of the jungle. They lived near a large river. The tribe was in need of urgent medical attention. A contagious disease was ravaging the population. People were dying daily. And a hospital was not too far away. In fact, it was just across the river. But the Indians would not cross the river because they believed the river was inhabited by evil spirits. They believed if they entered the water, they would die. Well, the missionary went and explained to the people that across the river was a hospital where their disease could be cured. He explained how he crossed the river and was unharmed. But the people were not impressed. He then took them to the bank of the river and placed his hand in the water. But the people still would not go in. Then the missionary walked into the water up to his waist and splashed water on his face and said, See, I'm still alive. And yet the Indians were still afraid to enter the river. So finally, the missionary dove into the river. He swam beneath the surface until he emerged on the other side. When he got out on the other side, he raised his fist in triumph in the air. He'd entered the water. He'd crossed the river, and he'd escaped with his life. It was then that the Indians broke out into a cheer and clapped and shouted because they saw in his life the proof that there was no power in the river. 
And that's what Jesus did. He entered the river of death and he came out on the other side so that we might no longer fear death but find eternal life in him. And he's able to save you because he's gone ahead of you and won the victory. He's conquered every foe. He's overcome death and he lives to lead us in victory. Every other prophet is in the grave but Jesus rose from the grave and is alive. Every other leader of every other religion has died and gone to eternity. But Jesus and Jesus alone lives. He's the eternal one, the resurrected one, the Savior that defeated death and leads us in victory across the river of death. That's why we must consider not only the claims of Jesus, but also the life of Jesus. The things he did on earth are a testimony to the fact that he is God. He is the only way. When Jesus was here on earth, he did what only God could do. He forgave sins. The word of God tells us in Luke 5, 20 to 21, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, Your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And yes, Jesus claimed to be God by forgiving sins. While he was here on earth, Jesus did what only God could do. His ministry, his life, is proof that God was with him. For the Bible says in Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all. Somebody say all. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. He delivered the demon possessed. Say amen. He healed the blind, the crippled, the deaf, and the dumb. Say amen. He calmed the storm and walked on water. Say amen. He multiplied the loaves and fish. Say amen. He gave comfort to all. Say amen. He raised the dead back to life. Shout amen. And John 21, 25 says, Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. And no one disputed these events. Even the enemies of Jesus did not deny his miracles. Even the Romans did not convict him and sentence him for making false claims. No, Pilate didn't deny his miracles. Herod didn't deny his miracles. The disciples who followed him were eyewitnesses to these events. They wrote them down. They lived with Jesus. And if anyone had the opportunity to see if Jesus was a hypocrite or not, it was the disciples. Yet all of them believed in him. Even Judas, who betrayed him, did not dispute the miracles of Jesus. Even Judas did not contradict the claims of Jesus. Even Judas did not deny what Jesus said. But even more than his life and miracles is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. The disciples were eyewitnesses to the ultimate proof of Jesus as Lord when he himself rose from the dead. That's why the apostle Peter said in Acts 3.15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this fact. And the fact is, of the original disciples who remained true to Jesus, all of them except for the Apostle John were martyred for their faith. All of them chose to die instead of deny the Lord. Even doubting Thomas, the disciple who originally doubted Jesus' resurrection, became so convinced that Jesus rose from the dead, he went to the land of India as a missionary. He was told by the people there to deny Christ, but Thomas refused. They thrust a spear through him and killed him. And what could make men so committed that they were willing to die for the truth they believed? It's the fact that they had seen Christ after his resurrection. They were eyewitnesses of his power over death, and they would rather die than deny. Here today... If a man knows he's involved in fraud, he may try to cover it up as best he can. He may lie and put out statements. But if you put a gun to a man's head when he's telling a lie and tell him to tell the truth or die, he will confess to the fraud. 
But Jesus was willing to go to the cross, and the disciples were willing to die a martyr's death for the truth they believed in. Thousands of people were eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection, and they chose to die rather than deny. They were so convinced of the claims and the power of Jesus, they'd rather die than deny. This is what sets Jesus apart and makes him unique. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion. This is what gives irrefutable evidence to Christ's claims. He rose from the dead. Every other religious leader who has ever lived is buried and has a grave. Every prophet, every teacher, every other man who ever lived and claimed to be sent from God has a grave somewhere. But there is no grave for Jesus. You can search the whole world over and you won't find any place where the bones of Jesus are buried. A large volume of evidence exists to support the resurrection claims. In fact, there is more legal historic evidence for the resurrection of Jesus than there is for Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. Secular historians, unbelievers such as Josephus, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, and Tertullian were convinced of the authenticity of the resurrection. Their writings validate the accounts of the gospel writers. In addition, other first and second century historians, including Cornelius Tacitus, Suetonius, Plinius Secundus, and Lysian of Samosata, acknowledged the impact the resurrection had on the people of the time. See, some today say, well, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. His disciples stole his body. But the fact is, Roman soldiers were closely guarding the tomb where Jesus' body was laid. An enormous boulder sealed the grave's entrance. The Roman guard, which usually composed of 16 members, would have made it impossible for the disciples, fishermen, to steal the body. And if the disciples stole Christ's body. Why didn't the Roman soldiers arrest them? After all, it was a crime to break the seal of the Roman Empire that was placed on the tomb. But Rome and Pilate and the soldiers made no attempt to prosecute the disciples because everyone knew they did not steal the body. Some people today say that, well, Jesus didn't die. He only fainted on the cross. Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus simply swooned or went unconscious, but he didn't die. But the fact is, the guards and the stone would have stopped Jesus from escaping. If he fainted on the cross and was put in the tomb and then the stone was rolled and the guards were there, after being beaten and flagellated, hung on a cross for six hours, pierced by the spear of his executioners to confirm his death, and wrapped in a hundred pounds of linen and spices, Jesus could not have recovered to roll away the stone and conquer the guards and appear radiantly to his disciples. The Jewish leaders of the day could easily have stopped Christianity from the very beginning if they could have produced a body. But the Jewish leaders could not stop the disciples because there was no body, no corpse. In fact, the Jews would have paid a huge sum of money to anyone, anyone who could produce the corpse of Jesus Christ. If you knew the location, you could have demanded millions to divulge the whereabouts. But no one did. No one. Because there was no body. Over 500 witnesses saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And it's this very fact that gave the church its powerful start. It's this very fact that is the reason why Christianity is the largest religion in the world today. It's the fact of the resurrection of Jesus that sets Christianity apart from every other religion. It's the only explanation for the transformation of the lives of the disciples. When Christ was crucified, the disciples ran and hid. But when they saw him after the resurrection, something changed in them. 
They became bold. They became uncompromising. They were willing to die rather than deny Christ. And that's still the same today. But you see, the fact is, Jesus is still doing miracles today. He's still healing the sick, casting out demons, and raising the dead. He's still saving souls and transforming lives. And those who experience the reality of his salvation are still standing up for the truth, even in the face of persecution. That's my testimony. I was lost. I was bound by sin. I was in darkness and death. I was chained by the devil. Then Jesus came into my life and I have been changed. I'm a miracle. I'm not the same. My own life is witness to the reality of the claims and the power of Jesus. I will never deny him even under the threat of death. I confess that Jesus is Lord. His claims are true. His power is real. What about you? Consider the life of Jesus. I'm not asking you to consider Christianity or a religion or a church. I'm not asking you to consider a program. I'm asking you to think about Jesus, what he said about himself and what he did on earth. I'm not asking you to join a church right now. I love my church. I believe it's a great place to grow in faith. But no church is perfect. And our church, no church, no church is the way to salvation. Only Jesus is the way. So consider Jesus. He claimed to be God. He said, I am the way. He backed up his words with a life of power. And ultimately, he backed up his claims by rising from the dead. And when you consider his claims in his life, it brings us to our third consideration. Consider the demands of Jesus on your life. But you see, if you accept the truth of Christ's claims about himself, then you must also accept the truth about his demand on your life. It's not possible to believe he is who he says he is and not agree that Jesus has a right to rule your life. It's impossible to believe that Jesus is God and not believe that you should surrender completely to him. For Jesus said in Luke 9, 23 and 24, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. If you believe that Jesus is God, if you believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation, if you believe that he died and rose again, then you must accept his demands on your life. You must yield and surrender yourself to him as the Lord of your life. For Jesus does not give anyone any other option but to believe fully in him as the only way of salvation. And based on that, he demands wholehearted devotion. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. If Jesus is not the only way to salvation, then for Jesus to make those demands is cruel and evil. But if he is the only way of salvation, then for Jesus to demand surrender from you is reasonable and required. And today, he stands with nail pierced hands and calls you to follow him. He's your God, your creator. He has every right to demand your obedience. He gave himself for you. He lived and died and rose again for you to be saved. He has every right to demand your surrender. Consider Jesus. Consider his claims to be the only way of salvation. Consider the life he lived, the power he displayed, and the fact that he rose from the dead. And consider his demands on you today. He calls you, come, follow me. Will you answer him? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone watching and listening today. I ask you to move by the power of your Holy Spirit on each and every heart. Open our eyes. Give us a revelation of the truth. No matter what we have believed up till today, speak to us clearly that we will consider your claims and accept you, Jesus, are the only way to salvation. Open our eyes to consider your life, your actions, your power, 
Open our eyes to consider the convincing, irrefutable evidence of your resurrection. And let us realize you are who you say you are. The King of glory, the Lord of creation, the Son of God. Open our hearts today to consider your demands on us. You call us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. Give us the grace to obey and to yield to you today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for joining us today for Truth For Today with Pastor Whitcomb. I trust that the message and ministry of Pastor Whitcomb is a blessing to you. These are three simple steps. First, admit that you are a sinner and ask God to forgive you. For 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For Acts 16, 31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Third, commit yourself to God. For Acts 2, 38 says, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Say this prayer after me. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask you to save me today. I confess that I have sinned against you. I am not worthy to be called your child. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died and rose again from the dead so that I might be saved. I ask you to come into my heart now by the power of the Holy Spirit and make me born again. I give my life to you and I'll follow you. Save me from sin. Deliver me from the devil. Heal me and fill me today. I thank you now by faith in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Next week on Truth For Today, Pastor Will Come comes your way with a new sermon. It has been an exciting journey with you throughout this sermon series. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to build your life on God's Word. God's Word is the only truth you can build your life upon. Thank you for watching Truth For Today with Pastor Whitcomb. There are many life-changing sermon videos by Pastor Whitcomb you can watch or download for free. Simply visit youtube.com to find Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb's YouTube channel and subscribe. You can also find sermon notes and daily devotionals for this and other sermons by visiting Pastor Whitcomb website at pastorrichardcwhitcomb.com. See, there's nothing too hard for God. No problem he can't solve. Nothing he can't fix. Nothing he cannot do. Receive daily inspiration by following Pastor Whitcomb on Twitter at RevRCW. Like and follow Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb on Facebook.com and Instagram at Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb for more inspiration. Let us know how this webcast has changed your life. Send us an email to pastor.whitcomb at agapehousegana.org Send your prayer request to prayer at agapehousegana.org. When you're busy, you consume your time with activity. You can also help other people see this video by donating to help promote this webcast. Just visit www.pastorrichardcwhitcomb.com to donate. Thank you and God bless you.